Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our entrepreneurship career panel brought to you by the Saskatoon Industry Education Council. This is a part of our Spotlight on Careers program, and once again, we're so happy you can join us. Uh, I happen to be coming to you today from Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. We're really excited that uh, when we're able to meet online, that we're able to span across the province, in fact, spanning across Western Canada today with some of our uh, panelists and spanning across multiple treaty territories. So thank you again for joining us today. We're really excited for all that we're about to learn. Um, our Entrepreneurship Career Pathways panel is hosted in partnership with the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce, which is part of, uh, or a partner with the Saskatoon Industry Education Council. Uh, and at the end of today's event, I will be sharing some more information about our Business and Finance Careers Week, which is uh, where we are right now we got some great events and resources for students teachers and parents to check out uh, today we are going to be hearing from four exciting entrepreneurs who are connected to our province and we hope that their stories and advice inspire and inform the young people of our province to consider how a future path in entrepreneurship may be uh, right for them uh, we invite audience members to type in questions into the Q&A at any time during this event. Don't wait until the end, get it in there as soon as you can and we will address it when the, when the time comes. We really want uh, you to, to pick the brains of these, uh, these experts that we have with us here today so that you can learn about this Hello, entrepreneurship welcome. pathway. Um, so uh, to get us started, we're gonna get some greetings from a few people and first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Janet Uchaz Hart, who is the Executive Director of the Saskatoon Industry Education Council, and she will be bringing you some greetings on behalf of the SIEC. So Janet, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Erin, and uh, welcome everyone to this great opportunity to learn about entrepreneurship and business. Um, I want to thank again the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce and all of our entrepreneurs here today for giving us uh, their time and their um, their and talking about their journey and their expertise in this area, and also to thank RBC uh, Future Launch as our sponsor of our uh, Spotlight on Careers programs. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about the SIUC, uh, we provide career development opportunities for youth and for educators and career practitioners through customized programs. Uh, you'll see at the bottom there are four different programs um, that, that we are featuring mostly online uh, these days. Uh, our Spotlight on Careers, which spans uh, a number of different sectors, um, as well as, um, uh, as business and entrepreneurship, but we've uh, delved into healthcare, manufacturing, construction, and it goes on and on. So you'll be able to, to see recording uh, opportunities uh, through our uh, saskatoonic.ca website. Also, uh, skills boot camps and connected programs and our summer youth internship program are some of those other programs we would like you to, to explore and see if you are interested in those programs. Um, as our IEC is a nonprofit, we work uh, primarily with K-12 education. We work with three school divisions, so Saskatoon Public, uh, Greater Saskatoon Catholic Schools and Prairie Spirit School Division, as well as the Saskatoon Tribal Council. And we also reach out to uh, community-based organizations, government agencies and employers, and we're trying to help nurture the workforce of tomorrow. So that is one of our key, um, um, our key objectives is to really work with youth and find out what their pathways are. And through this online platform, we're really excited about the opportunity to not only expand to uh, Saskatchewan, but also other parts of, of Canada. So we are able to help young people throughout, um, throughout our province. So thank you very much, Erin. Excellent, thank you so much, Janet, for bringing greetings. And uh, now, folks, I would like to introduce Steve McClellan. Steve is the CEO of the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. As I mentioned before, we partner with uh, the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce often on events such as this, and uh, they were also a, a great help when we got our new financial literacy program, Sask Money, off the ground. Saskmoney.ca is a website that you can check out for that. So, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks for bringing greetings. 
My pleasure. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to everybody for participating in this. I've always been a fan of the work that the Industry Education Council does. And your illustrious leader, Janet, is a rock star. And I applaud her efforts every single day. I want to say thanks to the uh, entire CIEC team for the work that you do. Uh, and uh, this is another example of helping get the word out about entrepreneurship and profiling some real rock stars in the Saskatchewan business community. So for that, I applaud your efforts. The Provincial Chamber, the Saskatchewan Chamber, is 101 years old. And during those years, the base of our existence have been the women and the men who lead or own the companies. You're going to hear some of those stories today. Large and small, urban and rural, startups or decades old companies. The only difference is, uh, is deso points and postal code. The opportunities, the, the work and, and the dreamers that are involved are many times very similar. To the panelists, I offer our congratulations on your success, and I look forward to hearing more of your stories today. I also thank you for sharing your story to keep younger entrepreneurs interested, to help them build, to grow, and to dream their businesses. From your experience, they will build their companies. We've also always appreciated the great, great work of the Industry Education Council, and the role has never been more important. The early stages of a person's labor market journey are critical, and the information and experiences that you can provide, including options like entrepreneurship, are important. Now, we have a very important program I want to briefly touch on. It's called TIN, Training Employment Network. It's done across the province with 12 local chambers. It helps individuals in a variety of sectors get involved with their business community, get engaged as an employee. But as important, because we're Chambers of Commerce, we make sure that the business community knows about the opportunities for young workers, 18 to 24, high school students, gig workers, women, Indigenous, newcomers. All sectors are being uh, referenced across the province. And if you're interested, go to the SAS Chamber website and get the information on it. There's also a program that's linked to that called Magnet. And it's a funding program where businesses can get supports to hire students to work with them for periods of time, summer jobs, part-time, whatever it happens to be. That's so important because early years work experience is critical. Help you help them is what I say to the business community. And I would say once again to uh, our panelists today, congratulations on your success and the Industry Education Council. Thanks for leading us all forward. Until we talk again, you have a great session and uh, I look forward to hearing the stories. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much, Steve. We uh, we always appreciate uh, the help of the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce, uh, again, for putting on events such as this with the IEC and, and uh, some of our other programs as well. Uh, and we appreciate the time you took today to, to bring greetings on behalf of the Chamber. Uh, so folks, we are going to get on to our main event right now, uh, what you all came here to see. Uh, so again, we have four exciting entrepreneurs who are going to be joining us today. We have Kieran Britton, Alicia Esmail, uh, Kendall Netmaker, and Andre Olinoff. And we are going to start off today's event just by having each of them share just about four or five minutes about their, their journey so far and where they are at right now so that you can get to know them a little bit. I know for our panelists, fitting, a, fitting your story into a short amount of time is a challenge, but we appreciate the, you doing that today. Um, we will also have lots of time afterwards to grill these entrepreneurs with questions. So uh, students who are watching this live, we encourage you to type questions into the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function. Uh, and teachers, you can type in those questions for your students, of course, as well. And we will address those as we go through today because we will be taking lots of time after we hear about their journeys to, uh, to answer some questions today and to really pick their brains, as I had said before. So uh, folks, we are gonna start off by introducing Kieran Britton. Uh, Kieran is with the Lady Alliance. And just to tell you a little bit about Kieran, Kieran is a person who loves to dream of the ridiculous and make it a reality. Whether it's cycling across Canada or converting a school bus into a full-time home, there is nothing Kieran enjoys more than testing the limits and learning more about herself. Growing up in the outdoors has created Kieran into who she is today, yet she still has hesitations and self-doubt. Kieran wanted to create a place where everyone could learn and grow together, demolishing self-doubt while building a community. Through the Lady Alliance, Kieran has found healing and solace 
friends and family, and a love for life through adventure. That sounds fantastic, Kieran. We're so glad that you could join us today, and we look forward to, to hearing a little bit about your journey. So thanks again for joining us, Kieran. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to join you guys. I'm joining you guys actually from the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, also known as Victoria, and I am born and raised Saskatoon. So the Victoria thing is mostly due to COVID. I mean, why not enjoy COVID by the coast? But um, I was really lucky to come up uh, like with that honor and that blessing to come out here because of what I do now. It did not start out that way. In five minutes, I'm gonna try and cram in everything, but I wanna start from where you guys are right now. When I graduated high school, I went into education with the idea of becoming a teacher. Um, I really wanted to change the lives of young people. That was where I wanted to go. What I learned along the way is not one decision to find my path. So from education, I transferred into business. From business, I actually took a break from school. I got a career. I cycled across Canada. I converted a bus into a house. I went on a long road trip. Um, and then I got another career and I just constantly shifted, changed, and then I finished my degree and, uh, and maintained that career. The career went from tech to event management to a whole bunch of different things. In May of 2018, um, the Lady Alliance, which was just an Instagram account at this point, it was not a big business. I didn't have the idea of it becoming a business it really started to take hold. Um, so by May of 29, or sorry, May of 2018, I started to notice, oh my goodness, this could become a business. And I actually quit my job and went full-time into the Lady Alliance. Uh, the Lady Alliance shifted and morphed and grew as time went on. Uh, we started as retreats. So we'd go hike the West Coast Trail. We'd go to Bali for a yoga retreat, or we'd go to the mountains and go hiking all with the goal to build confidence and community through adventure for women around Canada, which soon built to beyond and North America and people were flying in from Europe. But I realized that that wasn't sustainable and it was no longer authentic for me. I was starting to travel and, and work on these retreats and the retreats resembled work. I was no longer enjoying them for myself. So then I made another pivot in my life and that's when the Lady Alliance started doing tours. We actually started representing brands. What we would do is we would go to every storefront across North America on behalf of Arcteryx or a mountain equipment co-op or different brands like Fjall Raven and have an event that was customized to that brand in each, each uh, location. And then when COVID hit, we had to once again pivot. But by this time, I had become almost like a master of pivots and, and just no decision or no decision kind of defined who I was. So we decided to take our tours and our events, which were quite frequently film festivals and create a TV platform. Now with this TV platform, we have worked with companies like Red Bull, Fjall Raven, Mammut, and a whole bunch of other ones providing films and film festivals, kind of like the Banff Mountain Film Festival, but really amplifying the voices of women in the outdoors um, through, through a TV platform. So think of Netflix, but all adventure films and all, all amplifying the voices of women for everyone to enjoy. So we pivoted and shifted along the way. And it's crazy to think that all of this started with the decision to get into education for me. And what I've really learned is that once you get to a location in your life and you look back, the, the, li the line that you walk to get there should never be straight. It should be a lot like you're checking out every little nook and cranny along the way to get to where you want to go. But if you're trying to make that decision once to get to the end goal, you're missing out, you're missing out on a ton along the way. So the Lady Alliance has really opened the doors to us. We are three years in and we're still growing, um, but we're looking forward to really um, changing and morphing along the way, especially with this Lady Alliance TV platform and all of our amazing partners. Awesome, thanks so much for sharing, Kieran. Um, it's so great to hear that advice, uh, advice that we often share about, about people's pathway 
weaving and, and wandering and, and people finding their way throughout and uh, reacting to experiences that they are gathering and so on. So we really appreciate that, that uh, piece of advice for students. So thanks very much for sharing that. And, and we will come back to you with some questions in a, in a little bit. So thanks a lot. Thank you. You bet. Uh, folks, our next speaker uh, who's going to share her journey with you is Alicia Esmail. Uh, Alicia is with the Road Coffee Company, and coffee has never been far from Road Coffee founder Alicia Esmail's mind. It's an integral part of her daily ritual, and one she has savored for many years at home and throughout her worldly travels. Her past work executing development projects in Haiti, Nepal, and South Africa set fire to a deep desire to make a positive impact and spark change in an industry that is filled with turmoil and unethical practice. Driven by her experience and entrepreneurial spirit, Alicia set out to create that change. And with their body or Beyond Fair program, Road Coffee has developed a way for farmers to capture more value, grow their business and benefit the lives of their family and community. Road Coffee's innovative sourcing model and micro loan program is changing the coffee game. I just want a coffee now, Alicia. That that just that really inspired me to go get one. <laughs> We're looking forward to hearing about your journey, Alicia, and thank you for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate the, the kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone else. Thanks for joining us today. My journey started uh, when I was young in coffee. I always knew I was going to do something in coffee, but I had no idea that it would turn into what it is today. And it actually started with international development, as Aaron mentioned. And so when I was out of high school, I started going to school. And I was able to land my dream job at the time. So I was able to do development projects overseas from water security in Nepal to food security in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, it was a lot of fun. And what I realized uh, while working in these places is in all my free time, I would go and hang out on coffee and tea plantations, get to know the farmers and their kids. And I started to understand the supply chain from a very different perspective, from on the ground. And, and what I realized is there was a lot of inefficiencies and injustices within the supply chain. And I'd see these coffee farmers work incredibly hard and still be living in poverty, not being able to provide food or clothes or education for their kids and invest in their communities. And then I would come back to the West where I was born and raised in Saskatoon here and the first thing I would do when I'd get to an airport was spend five seven bucks on a coffee so eventually that disconnect started to really bug me and I wanted to try and do something about it so I moved home to Saskatchewan which was another interesting choice a lot of people were like you're already working on an international platform why would you move home to Saskatchewan in Canada. Wait, is that even a location? And uh, I was very confident then. That would have been, I moved home about six years ago or so, seven years ago. Um, but I was confident that Saskatchewan was gonna be a big player um, in international business in the future. And so I moved home and Road Coffee's been running for about five years now. And since then we've created a new sourcing model in our industry that doesn't exist. And so we work with a number of farmers directly, understanding their pain points and helping them come up with solutions. We pay coffee farmers above cost of goods, which I always say is uh, our industry's dirty little secret. So imagine, and there's a number of entrepreneurs on this call, imagine if uh, you know, it cost you this much to produce your product or service, but you were only getting paid you know, this much. You'd constantly be in the red and you'd constantly be at a loss. Well, that's how coffee farmers have been uh, doing it for generations. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've launched and it's been quite successful so far is our micro loan program. And so coffee farmers often don't have access to finances. And so we've come alongside them and we're able to offer these small loans at a reasonable price. So even if they can get a loan locally, Sometimes it comes with an interest rate of 50 to 70%. Again, just keeping them in perpetual debt. We're able to offer the loans at around six or 7% because we still want to teach them business skills and accountability. Um, 
not just give them a handout. And so uh, it's been really successful so far. We're continuing to grow that this year. We're about to launch some really cool female focused projects in Peru that I'm really excited about. Um, we Another cool thing about that is I uh, actually dreamt of running a microloan program when I was a kid. So back when I was in grade nine, grade 10, I used to sit at uh, a really good family friend of ours house. And I used to research Muhammad Yunus who won a Nobel Peace Prize for microloans. And I was so intrigued by the concept of how a small amount of money can impact and empower someone's life and have a huge ripple effect. And then, you know, life went on, I got into development, started a business. I totally forgot about that. And shortly after we launched our microloan program, this, this family friend of mine, who is also now my business coach, reminded me of this. And so I'd forgotten for like a decade about how that was a part of my dream. And here we are, we're doing it, we're, we're walking that out and we're, we're gonna scale it. And so whatever is going, I just wanna encourage you guys, whatever's going on in your mind right now and like some dreams you have, hold on to those because you never know when they might come full circle. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Alicia. Thanks for sharing your story. And we're looking forward to asking you some questions a little bit later on. Uh, so folks, we're also very excited to have Kendall Netmaker with us here today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him. Kendall is known as one of Canada's most accomplished entrepreneurs with over 25 awards in business to date. He was recently named one of Canada's top 40 under 40, the country's most coveted award for young business leaders. Each year, Kendall speaks to thousands of people worldwide on resilience, leadership, and power of telling your story. In addition to being sought after a sought after speaker, Kendall has authored the best-selling book, Driven to Succeed, From Poverty to Podium. He is the founder of Nietzsche Gear, a lifestyle clothing company that empowers youth through sports. Each year, they donate thousands of dollars to helping youth take part in sports. And Kendall's keynotes, workshops, and coaching programs have inspired thousands around the globe, and his goal today is to inspire you to become who you were born to be. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kendall. We're really excited that you can share your uh, insight and experience with uh, the students today. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you're all doing amazing today. It's Kendall Netmaker here today. Um, so I've been asked to come and share some, some, uh, some insights into our entrepreneurial journey, but more importantly, how we can help you by sharing our own experiences with this amazing panel here today. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up most of my life in, in a sweet grass first nation <clears throat> in, in a, by cut knife. So between cut knife and battlefords is my reserve there sweet grass. I was there from grade one to grade 12. And in that time, business entrepreneurship was never really a was never up here for me. I never thought about it. it never it was not in my my awareness at that time. I didn't really hear about entrepreneurship till I went to university. And when I was in Saskatoon, I was also a full time education student starting to become a teacher. I thought, yeah, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. I'm gonna become a phys ed teacher. I'm gonna coach volleyball teams, soccer teams. Like that's what I thought I was gonna do. At the, my last year of university. I heard about all these business competitions being posted throughout campus and across the province. And I thought, hmm, I want to apply and see if I, my idea is even worth something. So I remember showing up to all these different workshops, like webinars like this. But at the time, it was all in person. So when I would show up to all these different trainings about entrepreneurship, I had to immerse myself into to a field. I had no idea where to start. So going to all these different workshops, these trainings, you know, reading books, going to Google, YouTubing things. I had to learn how to do a business plan, had no idea what I was doing, and also how to do a business pitch, had no idea what I was doing. But I found people who mentored me. I went to go immerse myself. And I, I took all that information. I wrote it down on a piece of paper and I applied it. And many months after that, uh, a lot of cool things happened. I, I competed in those competitions. We won some startup money. I was able to uh, launch my company, Nietzsche Gear. And that started out of a one, one bedroom apartment in Saskatoon. And from there, the, the, when we started to in, create the story and the social mission into it of giving back to kids that grew up like me, helping underprivileged youth who cannot afford to take part in sports, that was like our mission. 
combined with the story, it created a um, almost like a snowball effect combining with a really nice product where people would buy our stuff and they'd want to come back and keep supporting the mission. Combining to, to the point where we would also give back and we would also show people where we're giving the money. So we would be sponsoring teams. I was actually a coach of many of those teams in the beginning. So that was all happening out of a one bedroom apartment. From the apartment, when there came a decision where every entrepreneur has to make, it's a decision of, do I let this be a hobby and do it part time? Or do I jump in with both feet and give it everything I have? Every entrepreneur has to go through that. And I remember going through that in, in, uh, in the apartment and I remember making a decision, jumping two feet in. And that what that created was there was no plan B. There was no way to, we had no choice but to succeed. And so at that moment, putting my feet into it, we went from a, the apartment to a little office downtown, the office to a little kiosk to a store. And then we opened up more stores, pop-up locations in the province. Then we started to do this thing called wholesale. We get our product into other people's stores. We opened up an e-commerce store, which is our, our main source of uh, uh, focus right now, nichigear.com. And then we also did another thing where a lot of other competitors weren't doing, doing custom orders for, for organizations, communities, for stations, communities, where we would co-brand our stuff. So that took us all the way to, to 2015. And 2015 came around, and I started to do these things called keynote speaking. I started to do, to, to do uh, keynote speaking, trainings, and so on. I would go, get invited to go to colleges, universities, associations, and so on. And then that transpired into a different business, uh, my, current, my current business, Netmaker Enterprises. And so it became a speaking business training company where we created another product of uh, our book, Driven to Succeed. Then we created Audible programs on Audible. Uh, we have three different programs on there. Then we created an online course. You could see the, 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 the slogan up there, Netmaker Academy, where we have all of our online courses, our coaching programs, our group programs, and so on. So, so much stuff has come from that. But I think the thing that we're most proud of is that we were able to give back and create our own nonprofit charity called Indigia Fund, helping indigenous, indigenous youth in sports, education, and culture. So, so much to ha has happened, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next five years, and I I'm just honored to be here with these amazing panelists, and uh, let's, keep the, let's keep this going. Hope that helps you. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kendall. And again, we're looking forward to asking you some questions in a few minutes here. Uh, and thanks again for joining us today. Uh, folks, our, our final panelist that I'd like to introduce to you today is Andre Olenoff from uh, Complete Technologies. Andre has always enjoyed working with new technologies and especially helping people to implement those technologies. He started working in IT when he was 14 years old full-time during summers and part-time during school. He received his bachelor's in computer science from Moscow, Russia, and then moved to Canada to study at the University of Saskatchewan together with his wife, Dasha, the day after they got married. That's amazing, Andre. <laughs> Both Andre and Dasha received the scholarships to do their master's thanks to their excellent grades back in Moscow. After graduation, Andre made one of the best decisions of his life or maybe second best after deciding to move to Canada, he decided to become an entrepreneur and open an IT service company in Saskatoon. Complete Technologies opened in September 2011, with Andre being the sole owner and operator, and now his company employs almost 20 people. Andre and Dasha have three children. In his spare time, Andre spends time with his family, trains for Iron Man, and reads classical literature. Andre, we're really excited to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us and excited to hear about your journey. Thanks, uh, thanks, Aaron, for uh, uh, such a great introduction. Uh, thanks, uh, Saskatchewan Chamber, for um, uh, inviting me to speak. And thanks, uh, Saskatoon Industry Education Council, for, uh, for organizing and, and uh, having me here, too. Um, I, I have, uh, uh, I was thinking about uh, what I can share and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the, sp the panelists today are, are great. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, hard to, to, to match uh, um, or the level of the stories, uh, and, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of try my best. Uh, I, I think the, the tips that I wanted to share with, uh, uh, with you guys um, are uh, to start your career early, uh, harness opportunities, and uh, um, 
the, the other one is uh, work smart rather than uh, work hard, although working hard is, is uh, uh, very important too. So I, I started uh, my uh, working career, I guess, or I, my first uh, uh, making money job was when I was 10 years old. I was, um, I, was uh, uh, I picked up uh, some uh, free uh, brochures with uh, a map of Moscow, uh, and I would approach people on the streets uh, to offer them uh, uh, to buy them for uh, two rubles, which uh, which would be um, uh, a price of a uh, like a Mortal Kombat game in the in the in the um, uh, video game place, and I wanted just to visualize that for you uh, here, if I can. Uh, I think my screen. Oh, let me swap this out. So uh, this is uh, this is where I grew up, and since you guys are all going to to school now. Uh, this is my school back in Moscow. Uh, and uh, uh, this is my house. It wasn't a very long uh, walk. Uh, my, my uh, uh, where I lived was on the 10th floor of this uh, apartment building. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, uh, a different setup from, uh, uh, from probably what your school looks like, but uh, just uh, visualizing that. So imagine those uh, streets and uh, a little 10 year old boy running around and just uh, offering uh, to buy those, uh, uh, approaching people offering to buy those maps. Uh, when uh, I was 14 years old, I had my first real job, like uh, Aaron mentioned. Um, I was doing uh, my first IT job. I was doing a junior tech uh, job at the big uh, uh, telecommunication company in Moscow, uh, full time during summer and part time during school. It was kind of um, tricky to juggle uh, those, especially during school uh, priorities, but it, uh, it definitely gave me a great insight into, uh, you know, uh, IT industry, excellent customer service, uh, uh, and that, I think, sparked my interest in, uh, in IT uh, in the first place. My, uh, um, uh, my, the school that I went to was a, a linguistic school, and when I graduated and went to do my bachelor's in computer science, I, I thought that my uh, uh, my language skills would not be uh, applicable anymore. Uh, but then uh, when uh, I was 20 years old uh, and I was just finishing up my bachelor's in Moscow, the opportunity came up to go study in Canada. And uh, uh, so like, uh, again, in my introduction as mentioned, my, uh, 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 my uh, uh, girlfriend at the time and I, we decided, uh, so we'll go together um, and uh, we got married just the day before we had a flight to uh, Canada. Um, and uh, uh, kind of fast forward a couple of years uh, when we graduated from master's degree, uh, I was excited. I was, uh, you know, I had my uh, two degrees uh, um, in IT and I went to uh, applied for a few IT jobs. And uh, uh, since I, 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 and I, I don't know, I, I think it, it, I didn't get any, uh, maybe I wasn't persistent enough in getting a job or it was just that I had no local experience at the time, but I applied for a few jobs, I didn't get any. And, uh, and then the thought came uh, to start the business. I never planned to be an entrepreneur, although my parents had a business in Moscow, uh, which I never really was involved in, but uh, that um, I think it gave me a, a, an, a, at least a mindset. So I, I uh, uh, started the company in 2011 um, so I was uh, 22 years old and uh, was uh, started in the business uh, that, that uh, um, uh, kind of my comment about work smart rather than, than hard. My, my goal was that I wanted the business to fit into my lifestyle rather, rather than my lifestyle, trying to uh, fit my lifestyle into the demands of the business. So for the last 10 years, I would rarely have weeks when I would work more than 30 hours a week. Um, Although when I do work, I work really hard, and there's a lot of time, thinking time that goes into uh, running a business. I'm kind of always on the phone, but uh, um, that that uh, kind of also leads me to the the bonus tip. I you know you if you have if you choose the entrepreneurship path, there's got to be someone you can uh, rely on, uh, run things by, and in the, in in my case, it's my wife. Uh, two heads are always better than one. And uh, um, my wife uh, is way smarter than I am, uh, anyway. So that's uh, that's a bonus too. Uh, and but I think it's uh, it's a key to have uh, uh, someone who, no matter what, will support you. So um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's just kind of highlights. Uh, and I, I I hope um, 
um, I, I hope to have uh, uh, to help you um, spark some interest in entrepreneurship and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Andre. And actually, we'll we'll invite all of the the panelists to to join us now. Uh, we we have uh, lots of time now for for some questions. And again, for our our audience members who are joining us live today, we encourage you to type some questions into the Q and A for our panelists so that we can uh, we can just gain from their insight and experiences and and learn and and hopefully help some people on a, on their future career journeys here uh to the panelists i'm i'm just amazed hearing these stories uh you know and it, it's interesting to hear that there are all of these different um themes that are coming out of the stories that you've shared so far and maybe unexpected for some people like the travel that many of you have experienced which which would be exciting to young people I hear about your passions and your values coming across in, in your work and leading you to where you are today and the connections that you make with people, which is which is really admirable and, and uh, exciting for the young people who are listening today. Um, so just a, a question that I'd like to start off with, um, and maybe Kieran, since we haven't heard from you, I'll, I'll start off with you, uh, and then anyone can jump in and, and uh, answer this as well. But um, for, for Oftentimes in, in school, students may not hear about entrepreneurship very much, as Kendall had mentioned. Um, are there any common qualities that, that you think you might find in someone who becomes an entrepreneur? I imagine it's quite diverse, but uh, Kendall, or Kieran, sorry, would you mind providing some insight into that, uh, just about qualities that make a good entrepreneur? Yeah, for sure. Um, so if you're thinking about entrepreneurship and you're wondering if you have what it takes, first of all, this does not limit anyone outside of these qualifications to become an entrepreneur. If you have your heart set on becoming an entrepreneur and you hear this and you're like, oh, this might not sound like me, don't let it deter you. Let, let yourself push through and, and see where you go with it. But I was listening to, if you haven't heard of the app Clubhouse, I suggested, I was listening to a Clubhouse discussion and um, it's where you can hear these greats talk and just discuss things. And Elon Musk was asked, um, well, how is it positioned? Uh, do you have any motivation for someone that wants to become an entrepreneur? And his response was, if you need motivation to become an entrepreneur, don't become an entrepreneur. <laughs> the reality of becoming an entrepreneur is you're going to fight an uphill battle every single day. You're going to come up against barriers and you're going to be juggling all of the hats there was a long time that I would work two seven hour shifts. I didn't take weekends, I didn't take holidays. If you want a very um, holiday-esque job that maybe is a little bit more predictable, that's got a little bit more of a clear outline, maybe entrepreneurship isn't for you. If you like a challenge, if you're excited about what you can grow, if you're passionate about what you're doing and you see a wrong that you wanna write, um, and you have what it takes to grind through when it really makes a tough or when it, something's really tough and, and there's barriers along the way, then you have what it takes to become an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. An entrepreneurial spirit doesn't get swayed by a no. They, uh, they make a no in any way, shape or form they can somehow a yes or a continue forward. Um, so I find, I look back on my work history and how hard and long and um, smart that I had to work in order to put together this company. Um, and only now am I getting weekends and holidays mm -hmm. and time to myself, but it's not, it's not a, a have the benefits upfront kind of choice. And so if you have what it takes, if you like to grind, if you love to dive into something and you just can't let it go, um, and if you are really passionate about what you're doing, then you probably have what it takes, but that internal motivation is so key. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kieran. Uh, do any of our panelists wanna join in on that question as well, just about qualities of an entrepreneur uh, that uh, you might add on to Kieran's insight there? Sorry, I was I was actually just typing in an answer there, but oh, okay. the, kind of along the same lines. Uh, to, like I, I would totally echo what uh, uh, Kieran just said, uh, but also for for me, I find that uh, one thing that uh, that always um, stuck out for me was I, uh, I I I would see things that uh, 
I, um, I don't think are done well. And uh, it would bug me uh, so much to uh, not be able to, you know, correct that or do it better. Or like, I have so many advices for people. It's just ridiculous. Like it's, I, and uh, <laughs> sometimes it, uh, you know, I, I try to hold it to myself. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the IT thing was something that I knew how to do. And I, after doing research uh, and finding that uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, what is offered in Saskatchewan and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I thought that I could do uh, it better and provide better service. Um, you know, it was just uh, clear to me that, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to do it. But uh, yeah, so many, if, if you, if you find yourself with the burning desire to improve something and you, and you think you got what it takes to uh, do it better than, uh, you know, than, than average or other people. And if you uh, genuinely love that thing that you're going to do, uh, I think that's a, that, that's the recipe for success. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andre. Um, just, we did have a question come in live that's, I think is tagging off of what Andre was uh, just relating to there. And someone wanted to know what the, what the first thing a person might want to do if they if they think of a business that they would like to run um i think andre has been hinting at that he kind of found a niche and found a need but uh would anyone care to share some insight on into that question that just came into us uh uh perhaps uh, uh kendall if if you join in on that any thoughts of the first thing people could do when they want to start a business yeah sure i i I always tell people that, you know, entrepreneurs, they have this, that's why I wear this shirt drive. It's driven, right? You have to have that drive first. You, like you can't, that comes from within, right? It can also be conditioned from child to present. Um, but the experiences that you've been through, it can condition that drive within yourself, but you have to combine that with, um, you're almost, you're, you're, you're a solution to people's problems. Like if you're a service provider, you the, the things that you do well at you are helping people alleviate their, their their pain points so every entrepreneur out there you are you are the the solution you are you are focused on solutions and providing those to as a product as a service or a combination of both but this has to be there if you don't have that drive you're not going to be able to do what kieran's does does like you know stay up on the weekends they stay up on you know many of us in this 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 panel right now you know we're probably either up really early or we're up we're staying up really late working on our stuff like i i'm always i tell people like i have two children i had to juggle that in between i drop them off here i come back to the panel i'm working to like pick them up after after school put them to bed with with my wife and then all of a sudden i got about another four hours to work so uh, you have to maximize every hour every minute that you have if you want things to work and it's not by choice you need to do it it's like you have to do it like it's a feeling that like you can't teach that so come, I, the best way i can describe it, it's a drive so hope that helps excellent yeah definitely an important quality to to have uh and to think about the time and effort that it takes uh, to put into what you're passionate about right uh any other thoughts folks on the the just first steps in in starting a business when someone finds something that they're interested in alicia would you like here to pop in on that one yeah so i would add um i i definitely agree with what Ken just shared i would add if there's an industry or a topic you're interested in start researching it in depth you can learn most things on the internet now and there's no excuse um to wait for someone else and entrepreneurship you can't wait on other people you have to teach yourself you i bet every single one of these other entrepreneurs are learning every single day and so if you can start learning now and deep diving in, you'll, as you're learning, you'll start to spot the gaps in the market and problems that still need to be solved. And that might be how you find the thing that you want to tackle. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, other thoughts, folks, on uh, just starting up that own business or advice for students that, uh, that just think of something that they might be interested in? Yeah, um, along the along the lines of Alicia, I really love that you have the opportunity to really charge forwards to, onto so many different platforms. So don't limit your research to just Googling online. 
get into like apps like Clubhouse and hear the giants talk, see how they talk, see how they deliver their message so that you can become not only the expert in the area, but you can deliver it eloquently as well so that you look like the expert in the area. Your research is tenfold. It should be not only on the industry that you want to get into, but the, the language that needs to be delivered with it, the personality that needs to, is it more of a sales position that you need to be in, or is it more of a research position that you need to be in, a more um, educationally focused research, um, delivery when you're, when you're talking about what you're trying to create. So really expand that research and don't just fall into the types of research that you are taught maybe in school or different things like that when you're doing a project, broaden that and find all of these different areas, audible books or uh, clubhouse or going to coaching sessions or whatever that might be, broaden that research. Excellent. That theme of uh, lifelong learning seems to be really important with an entrepreneur, uh, just from the, the comments that have been made recently from, from our panel here, and uh, uh, something that I know our teachers will appreciate as well to hear. <laughs> uh, and again, folks, I encourage any questions to come into our Q&A for our panelists today, uh, so we can uh, continue to gain some knowledge from them. Uh, we do have a few more minutes to, to, to pick their brains. Um, one one question that I did want to throw out to the panel. I know that uh, for entrepreneurs, and it was hinted at this with with some of the comments that you made before, but there is there is definitely a sense of risk uh, when you are starting your own business and becoming an entrepreneur. Um, just any thoughts on how entrepreneurs and such as yourselves approach risk or even approach challenges that you may face with your business on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, any thoughts that you could share with our students on that? Uh, Andre, if you could start us off, please. Sure. Um, I uh, uh, quickly add to uh, um, what the earlier panelists said about uh, researching. As part of the research, uh, it, one thing you could also do, and this applies in Saskatchewan uh, so much, any one of, uh, if, you, if you're, while you're researching, you're finding some local experts, uh, reach out to the local expert, like the, the people in the uh, veterans in the industry, uh, old business people, uh, and old, I mean, not by age necessarily, but by age, including, uh, I mean, everybody's so open in this province. That's what I like. Uh, that's what I love about Saskatchewan. It's just the business community is so open. Everybody's willing to share. Um, I've, I've shared exactly what I've done with my business with so many people, and I was never uh, for a, a second uh, thinking that, uh, you know, that's a risk and uh, someone wants to, uh, you know, just going to come around and do the same thing because I don't think it's possible. But as far as uh, uh, handling risks, uh, you know, when I when I uh, started the business, I uh, when I came over to Canada, I had, uh, um, um, you know, kind of I think it was our wedding gift technically it was like uh, $10,000 um, uh, that we brought and we never spent it uh, in the first two years of uh, our master's. And then uh, uh, when I didn't get a job, it, it was, uh, we basically invested everything in the business and uh, it never even occurred to me that it was risky for some reason. I don't know, now looking back at it, I think it's kind of dumb. Uh, maybe it was the 22 years old thing, um, uh, but uh, you know, I it, it felt so natural. And uh, uh, to this day, I think, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, the, the Einstein's quote, uh, in the middle of crisis, uh, lies an opportunity. If there is a, like a, um, you know, crisis and it, it may be perceived as risk for, by some people, I think entrepreneurs see that as an opportunity. Um, every time there is a, um, uh, there is a, uh, you know, challenging situation with the client, uh, or a concern, I think it's it's the it's an opportunity to um, uh, strengthen relationships uh, rather than you know it's a it's a you know risk that's that's the way I look at it and that's the way I've uh, I've been treating it so um, yeah that's that's my take. Excellent, uh, thanks, Andre. Anyone else want to join in just on the thoughts about the way that entrepreneurs approach risk and challenge? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a, a few things here. Um, first off, you know, I, I'm assuming there's a lot of youth here, Aaron, that are mostly watching this. So I would say that that's the best time to try this stuff <laughs> is when you're young, because when you start having children, um, let's pretend you have a, you're even a, maybe you're a teacher, right? I, I'm, I'm also a teacher. I, maybe I could have been teaching right now. And if I would have started 
now, two children, maybe you got a mortgage by that time, you know, it's tougher to make a risk when you're comfortable. When you're when you're conditioned to get that paycheck, it's very difficult to make that risk. So I tell people if you're if you're able to and you're a student, try things. Just like Alicia was talking about, try things, go, go and try sell things, you know, um, make things out of nothing, like, like research things that are, that are interesting. You go to these workshops, come to webinars like this, just immerse yourself. If it piques your interest, there's something there. And, you know, eventually you may, the first product may not work out like myself, my first brand didn't work out, but maybe the next one will, maybe the next one will, but you have to keep throwing yourself out there. Um, you know, the, 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 it's because something doesn't work doesn't mean that the next one won't. You know, I always tell people that Nietzsche gear was a blessing in disguise because my first brand failed and it failed on like a national scale. So, um, you know, going through that, uh, that failure feeling up here uh, and then reinventing a new brand, it, it gave even more drive to make that successful. So um, do it when you're young. Uh, it's tougher to do it when you're comfortable. It's not impossible. But I, I always tell people do it when you're young because that's when you have the least amount of risk, primarily financially, because most of you are probably used to not having a lot of money as a student, myself included. I was also raised like that in, the, in a, not having a lot. So when I was able, I, you're, you're, you're able to stretch money more effectively when you're young that way, because it's tougher to do that when you're when you start getting you know more comfortable in your living. So um, sum it up. If you can try it right now, try a lot of things, try selling things. You never know what could take off for you. That's fantastic advice, Kendall. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I could continue talking about this question for, for a long time. There's so much for students to learn about that, that mindset of an entrepreneur. And, and uh, we, we, I'd love to dig into that more. I am conscious of the time here. I do want to want to throw out one more question to our panel. I think we've, we've got a, one of the strengths of our panel. We've got a really diverse experiences and diverse backgrounds on our, our panel here today. And, and we're so thankful for that. Um, a theme, another theme that I've noticed that come up uh, once or twice here is that sometimes there are some limits that um, some young people may perceive on getting into entrepreneurship or starting their own business, running their own company. Uh, there especially may be some limits perceived from people who may not see many opportunities. I know uh, Kendall had mentioned before about, uh, about people from underprivileged communities, perhaps uh, marginalized communities. Um, do you folks have any advice for, uh, for people who, who may be uh, from those communities, uh, some young people who, who may see some limits in front of them, uh, some advice that you might give them in getting started in business, especially in Saskatchewan? Any thoughts on that? Thanks, Alicia. I, yeah, for sure. I would say I, I do, I feel like the, the comment I wanted to make about the last question kind of slides into this. I like what Kendall said about fear and mentioning fear. I think the fear and risk is tightly tied together. Fear is one of those things that's intangible and it's, it's a really interesting topic. But I think fear often holds us back than risk because what's behind the risk? It's the fear of loss or fear, fear of failure. As we, if you can do one thing, get comfortable with failing because the more you fail, the more you succeed. You actually have to fail. I've never met an entrepreneur, a business owner, or anyone that's done something of impact and influence without failing pretty, pretty good and multiple times. Um, I actually would reference back something Andre said about um, go and find people who have done it. You know, like I, I didn't have anything when I moved back to Saskatchewan. I had uh, my beat up car to my name. And I just started surrounding myself with people I looked up to in the business community, people I wanted to be like. And I just, as much as I could with respecting their time, I just got around them and asked them questions. And you'd be surprised what doors can open when you just put yourself out there and take risks but sometimes that's the scariest part when you're first starting and getting past the uh maybe some insecurity around what would they think or what if I'm not good enough if you can silence those insecurities and just choose courage in those moments um that's that's what I would say and a practical tip in that that I heard once when I was just getting started is go and find the scariest person in the room 
are most intimidating and, and just go talk to them and stri strike up a conversation. We'll pass it off to some. That's excellent advice about the uh, just challenging yourself to find those mentors. That's that's excellent. Anyone else care to join in on their advice for uh, for people who are just starting out, particularly the people from perhaps from underprivileged groups? Yeah, I'd love to chime in on that. Um, Thanks, Karen. You hit the nail on the head with failing for success. Um, every single employee that comes on to the Lady Alliance at this point has some kind of history in entrepreneurship. I love those people. I love that they're coming in, they wanna grow it, they wanna try and improve it, but there's a lot of hesitation. They're coming into a community and what they don't see is that I want to make sure that everyone's voice is amplified through the Lady Alliance and not just mine. So it's really important for me, for these people to put their voices forward. And there's a lot of hesitation there, especially on our social media, where there's an audience, there's a lot of hesitation, there's a lot of fear, because there's, there's a, a risk of exposure or saying the wrong thing or whatever that might be. And I always tell every single one of my employees that come on, I want you to fail for me, fail forward. Because if you're, if you're learning from your mistakes and you're learning from your failures, that means you're taking a shot and you're trying at it. And that's all that I can ask. When I look back at what I've done, I consistently failed forward. There was an immense amount of risk with it. I didn't pay myself for a year. I lived behind uh, Save On Foods in Canmore in a school bus. And I ate at soup kitchens to try and get this thing off the ground. It was immensely difficult. There was a huge risk to it. I had a mortgage back at home. I didn't know what was going to happen, but you can't move forward without trying it. And if you're staying within your comfort zone, you'll never grow from without with it, from within your comfort zone, grow out of your comfort zone. So I think that that's really important and just kind of like making sure that you're always making those decisions when they're fear-based that are always aligning with your authenticity and your yourself. Because if you're working and failing forward in a way that's authentic to you and the way that feels comfortable to you, you can try things, they might not work out, but it's not a failure. Amazing advice, Kieran, thanks so much. Uh, Kendall or Andre, just wanna jump in on, on any advice you'd give to young people, just last thoughts here before we wrap up. Um, I, I'll my mind would be quick. Uh, I think it just uh, kind of echo um, what uh, Alicia said when I when I came to uh, Saskatoon um, and uh, before starting a business, I, I spent two years here in at the university. Uh, but uh, when I was starting a business, uh, a lot of advice I was reading was, uh, you know, the first people to start with would be from your kind of networks uh, or connections. And, uh, you know, and it was like, uh, go to your uh, realtor, go to your uh, lawyer go to your accountant and I was like okay who do I know I, I don't know I know my professor I know other uh, grad students at the department I know zero people there so I went out and I started networking like crazy now when I when I uh, go to uh, uh, networking events well not now but a year ago um, you know and you'd have a, a room you know filled with uh, five six hundred uh, uh, business people in, in from Saskatoon, uh, you know, I I safely say I would know two thirds of the room uh, by now, and that turned into the kind of professional thing. So getting to know people, building connections, uh, surrounding yourself uh, with business people, uh, I think is is uh, uh, is key when you start out. Um, and I think there was a question there that got answered, but um, yeah. So I, I think uh, I just uh, e echo that uh, for sure and. Uh, um, yeah, ri risk and starting early. So, you know, so, so much uh, uh, key. Um, I, I, uh, we, I had a child on the way when, uh, 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 when started a business uh, and uh, we, we like kind of, you know, similar setup, uh, what Kieran says. And, you know, not, I, I don't say those things um, to many people because it just feels so natural, but you know, we had no furniture in the apartment. We we had boxes instead of tables, uh, and that didn't bother us for a second. Like it just was uh, felt so natural. And when the first year, uh, you know, I you know the business made like fifteen thousand dollars, and the second year it made sixteen thousand uh, dollars. You know, I didn't think that it 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 was failing. I thought it was just uh, you know early stages, and you know uh, now it's the whole different ball game. So yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much, Andre. Uh, Kendall, I'll just throw it to you. Any last thoughts uh, just on, on what we've been speaking about here? 
Sure, I'll, I'll speak to the indigenous population because that's a, a, a market that's rising, especially in, in the entrepreneurship face across this country. One of the things that I've been seeing here in the last, uh, I would say two years, especially now, especially through COVID, is this rise of indigenous entrepreneurs coming and, and starting things. And they're trying things on Facebook, on even on TikTok, on Instagram. They're, uh, they're creating online stores. And I never used to see like, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, when I first started, I couldn't even think of two other people that were just like me in Saskatchewan that I can go and have coffee with. Now there's dozens. So, so much has happened in the last 10 years. And I feel like it's um, for anyone who's watching this, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, find ways to work together because that's where the true power lies. Form masterminds, talk to each other, just like Kieran was talking about, go on Clubhouse, create your own Clubhouse on, on, on messengers and so on. Talk like this on Zoom. You know, the more you can build communities like that, the more you can support each other. And that's what, you know, I, I've been a part of many masterminds. I've gotten a lot of value from them. So you never know who's going to be able to help you unless you go and find them and talk to them. Unless you put yourself out there, unless you go to these network, networking events. I've always been a shy kid growing up, but I've had to throw myself into a room and try to network with people, try to talk to people. It's terrifying, but you have to do those kind of things if you want to get opportunities for yourself, that's just part of the game you have to play. But you know what? It gets better. You get more confident. As you become a more confident entrepreneur, those risks, the risk factor starts to go lower, lower. And you just, you become, you become like a momentum machine. So keep going, keep growing, keep moving forward. Thank you. Excellent advice. And and I just think of the mentors that we have here for, for the young people who've joined us today. Just an example of, of, of how there are people in our community who are willing to help uh, share experiences and help people get off the ground. And, and with that, I just want to say to our panelists, I, I mean, I, I would love to talk to you for, for much more time, but we are limited by time today. Uh, we really thank you for sharing this advice, sharing your experience and, and your knowledge with the students today. Uh, I know that whether people are watching live or, or watching our recording afterwards, there's so much to learn from you. And we thank you so much for sharing today. Uh, it's, it's so important to, as, as just your presence here indicates to, to share with the young people to, to learn about this entrepreneurship and business path. So, so thanks so much for doing that. Um, folks, uh, as we do with, with many of our SIEC events, um, I do want to, um, to get some feedback from, from students. So uh, on your screen, you should be seeing a, a, a student feedback link. So if you are a student who is watching live or watching afterwards, uh, we'd like you to, to scan that QR code or go to that URL and type in some, some feedback for us. Uh, for, at the SIEC, we want to improve our programming uh, and we, uh, we really value the feedback for, for many, many reasons. Uh, and as well, teachers, we would like to get some feedback from you on these events. We would really appreciate hearing from you and, and how we can improve uh, resources and so on that you may be sharing with students as well. So you can see that there's a QR code and just a slightly different link. Ooh, it skipped on me there, uh, but you could check that out as well. Uh, folks, we also have an event. If you are watching this live, you're lucky because later tonight, uh, 6.30 p.m., we have another panel focused on business and finance careers. Uh, Edwards School of Business is going to be a part of that, as well as some other experts to share their career journeys. So uh, you can go to our website and register for that, and we would uh, love to see some more people out for that one tonight. Uh, and as well, we have lots of different resources available for you online. You can see our website address at the bottom there, saskatooniec.ca. We have some uh, interviews with some local entrepreneurs who uh, different from our panelists today who share advice in their journeys as well. So you can check out that video series, as well as some post-secondary information videos and resources that you could check out online uh, if you're interested in learning about some post-secondary pathways that you may follow. At the IEC this year with our spotlights, we're focusing on a different sector every month. You can see where we are in February and where we've been before this. 
Next month, we were focusing on careers in emergency services. In April, we're focusing on the skilled trades and then careers in information and communication technology, including our world famous digitized event, which will be happening in May, which we're looking forward to. So students, we hope that you will be a part of those and teachers that you can uh, be a part of those as well. And in order to be up to date with those events, we hope that you can join us on some of these platforms that we are on. If you were also on any of these social media platforms, uh, give us a follow uh, from YouTube to Instagram. Uh, and you can always check out our website for more information and contact us through there as well. Again, I thank you so much for joining us. I thank the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce and the SIEC staff for their help today. And we, uh, we hope that your future career path is perhaps just a little bit more clear and even a little bit more exciting after today. So thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Yeah.